When automobile companies develop a new car, they spend a lot of time looking at what the competition has to offer. They will buy several cars they think the customers will also consider when looking at their product, and they will test those cars subjectively and objectively. One of the competitive cars that consistently rated best during my years in the auto industry was the E39 BMW 5 Series introduced in 1996. Everything about cars is a compromise. Handling versus comfort, ride versus steering feel, impact harshness versus shake. It's all a compromise and after all these years, I still believe the E39 BMW had the best combination of ride, handling, comfort and utility of any car before. They had just the right balance between all those attributes, which made for a car that was so good at so many things, I would even go so far as to say it has never been bested since, even by BMW. So what made this car so good? I think a lot of it has to do with the new Integral Link rear suspension BMW introduced with that car. It was a totally new concept, and I think made the car what it was. The rear suspension in any car is by far the most important suspension. It determines how the car will turn into corners. It determines how it will handle. It Will it understeer or oversteer? Will it provide a feeling of stability or not? You can do more to help steering feel with the rear suspension than with the front, even though the steering is part of the front suspension. The way the rear suspension behaves dominates how the overall car will behave. Let's take a closer look at an integral link suspension then and find out what makes it tick. Hello everyone, I'm Hubert Mace and this is Suspensions Explained. <laughs> to help understand how the integral link suspension works, I've built a computer model so we can see all the parts and how they connect. As with any suspension, the job of the suspension is to control the movement of the knuckle. Where the knuckle goes is where the wheel goes, so control the knuckle and you control the wheel. And this is all about degrees of freedom. If you haven't seen my video on degrees of freedom and how they work, you can check it out here. Let's look at the parts of an integral link design. Looking from the inside out, we see the knuckle in blue. It is attached to the lower control arm in green with a ball joint. The arm is attached to the car structure with two bushings. Next, we have an upper link, which is attached to the knuckle and the car with ball joints at each end. There's also a toe link, also attached to the knuckle and the car with ball joints. Lastly, there is a small vertical link between the lower arm and the knuckle. This is the integral link that gives the suspension its name. I'm not showing the spring and damper or drive shafts here because they aren't critical to understanding how the design works. So how do these links control the knuckle's movement? Since the knuckle, like any other object, has six degrees of freedom to start with, and we only want to allow the knuckle to move freely up and down, which is one degree of freedom, we need to remove the other five degrees of freedom. To do this, we need five links. Here are the five links in an integral link design. The lower arm is in effect two links, both ending at the same point. The upper link is the third, the toe link is the fourth, and the small integral link is the fifth. With these five links, we remove five degrees of freedom, which will only allow the knuckle to move up and down like this. So what would happen if the integral link wasn't there? Let's remove it and see how the knuckle now moves. As you can see, the knuckle can still move up and down, but now it can also move fore aft through a rotating movement. Without the integral link, the wheel would just flop fore and aft as soon as you touch the brakes or hit the gas. There is another way to stop this 4F movement though, and that is to turn the upper link into a control arm, which has the effect of adding another link. Here we see how adding another link to the upper link turns it into a wishbone and makes it look a lot like the lower arm. Doing this turns the suspension into a double wishbone, and that's really what we have here. The integral link is an evolution of the tried and true double wishbone design. So why not just stick with a double wishbone? Well. The integral link gives a very important advantage that, in my view, becomes even more important with electric vehicles. It also has an important disadvantage that we'll talk about later. As I mentioned earlier, the main function of a suspension is to control the movement of the wheel. But the suspension also has another very important function, and that is to absorb the energy coming up from the road from road roughness and impacts before it gets into the body and causes noise and discomfort to the occupants. Suspensions do this by incorporating rubber bushings between the control arms and the body structure. 
These bushings allow the suspension to deflect slightly when it is subjected to forces coming from the road, and that deflection softens the blow of the impact. It's a little like the difference between punching a brick wall and punching a pillow. Let's look at a typical double wishbone suspension and see how the bushings help it deal with an impact. We'll use the double wishbone we created earlier. When an impact comes along and the tire hits it, if we didn't have any bushings in the suspension, it would just move up and over the bump according to the design of the links and the control arms. If we track the wheel center, you can see how it moves up and down along a straight line. But now, if we include bushings in our design, we allow the control arms to move rearward slightly in response to the impact. You can see here how the front bushings on both the lower and upper arms are deflecting. You can also see how the wheel center is now not moving in a straight line anymore, but along a rounded path. What we've done is instead of forcing the suspension to move up and out of the way immediately, we've given it a little extra time by moving rearward before it has to move up. We've given the suspension more time to get out of the way of the bump. The extra motion and the extra time we've given means the suspension doesn't have to move as quickly and as a consequence doesn't transfer as much energy into the body structure. We can see the same thing in an integral link suspension, except that here the only bushing that is deflecting is the lower arm front bushing. Sounds great, right? So what's the problem? Well, unfortunately, these same bushings allow the suspension to deflect in unwanted ways as well, especially during braking. Let's look again at our double wishbone suspension and apply the brakes instead of hitting an impact. We'll show this in our model by locking up the wheel. In a suspension that doesn't have any bushings, nothing changes because the suspension can't deflect in reaction to the braking force. But in a suspension that has bushings, the braking force causes the lower arm to deflect in the rearward direction, but it also causes the upper arm to deflect in the forward direction. What this does is twist the knuckle when we look at it in the side view. The suspension has been twisted and is no longer the same design. The ball joints are now in different places, but more importantly, the angle of the toe link has been changed. And the angle of the toe link controls how the suspension steers as it moves up and down. As the wheel moves up and down, the suspension needs to control the toe or steer angle of the wheel, and that is done by the toe link. And the angle of the toe link determines if the wheel steers a little or a lot, steers to the left or to the right as the wheel moves up and down. Small changes in the angle of the toe link can make big changes in the way the wheel steers as it moves up and down. This is a very sensitive part of the suspension design. Change the angle of the toe link by a millimeter at either end and you make a big change in the way the suspension behaves. This means that during braking, when the suspension has been deflected, it behaves differently than when you're not braking. There is a way around this, and that is to make the bushings very stiff so they don't deflect very much. Of course, that also means they don't do a very good job of absorbing the energy coming up from the road, which makes the ride and the road noise inside the vehicle worse. We don't want that. The way to fix that is to attach the entire rear suspension to a subframe that itself is connected to the body structure with large soft bushings that are widely spaced apart. That way, the suspension can have stiff bushings to control the wind-up in braking, while the subframe has soft bushings to absorb energy and isolate the body from road noise and impacts. This is exactly what most every mid to high-end vehicle does. Here is an example of the BMW 5 Series where you can clearly see the entire rear suspension is attached to a subframe and that subframe has four bushings attaching it to the body. Clearly, this method works very well. Cars like the 5 Series are very quiet inside and isolate their occupants exceptionally well from road noise and impacts. But let's talk about what is really happening in this case when the subframe hits an impact in the road. As we saw before, when the suspension hits an impact, it needs to be able to move rearward slightly to absorb the energy. But if we've designed the suspension with stiff bushings to control wind-up and braking, then in order for the suspension to move rearward, the entire subframe needs to move as well. Since the subframe is attached to the body with soft bushings, it can move, but remember that the subframe is also carrying the differential and half shafts, so all this stuff needs to move rearward along with the subframe. That's a lot of mass that's moving around every time you hit an impact in the road. In the case of an electric vehicle, not only is there a differential sitting on the subframe, but there's also a motor and inverter which are significantly heavier than just a differential like the one in the BMW. 
That represents a significant increase in the amount of mass that is moving and shaking along with the suspension, and that can lead to problems with a shaky feeling in the vehicle. It can feel like the car never really settles down after hitting a bump. So what does all this have to do with the Integralink suspension design? Well, I believe this design has a feature that solves these problems, and that is why we chose it for the Tesla Model S. We've seen what happens in a double wishbone when we hit the brakes. Now, let's look at what happens when you do the same in an integral link suspension. As you can see, the lower arm bushing still deflects just like it did in the double wishbone. But now, since the integral link is what controls the rotation of the knuckle, all it can do is move rearward along with the lower arm. There is no rotation of the knuckle, and so there is no change in the geometry of the suspension. Of course, it is still possible for the entire lower arm to rotate in response to the braking torque, but the span between the two inner bushings can be made fairly large, and it is possible to make those bushings quite stiff in the vertical direction without making them stiff in the outward direction by using voided bushings like this. A bushing design like this would allow the arm to move outboard easily, thereby allowing the suspension to move rearward, while still resisting the vertical deflection caused by the brake torque. The result of all this is that you can make an integral link suspension fairly soft in the rearward direction without having the geometry change issues under braking. This allows you to make the bushings holding the subframe relatively stiff to help control the motion of all that mass which the subframe is carrying in an EV. Now in the beginning I did mention a problem with the integral link design which is causing some companies to move away from it and that is that the design is very limited in the amount of rear steer you can put in. So, if your suspension and vehicle design calls for rear steer to help with handling or turning circle, the integral link is not their best choice. But for any other car, I still think it has the best functionality and the best compromise between ride, handling, and comfort. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and hitting that notifications button, and we'll see you next time for more Suspensions Explained.